to talk about Bidenomics and a whole lot more, I'd like to welcome Jonathan Williams back to the show. He is the American Legislative Exchange Council's Executive Vice President of Policy and their Chief Economist. And you can find out more about them by heading to alec.org. Jonathan, it's great to talk to you again. Well, great to be back with you, my friend. And as always, I bring you greetings from the land of make-believe here in Washington, D.C. Well, you know, and you were just literally out here in Oregon just a couple of days ago. And uh, it was great to see you in, in person again. And uh, you're looking great. Well, it's great to see you guys, and great to be back out. Yeah, you know, it's uh, you know, some some probably consider Oregon a land to make believe as well. Unfortunately, <laughs> yes, uh, I, I'm sure they do. But anyway, yeah, you're looking good. Uh, it was great to get caught up a little bit there and seeing you in person. It's always nice to uh, actually see people that we, that we've known for so long. But anyway, uh, we're here to talk about Bidenomics. Although I don't know if you know this, it turns out we've been pronouncing it incorrectly all this time. It's actually pronounced. By dumbnomics, as we're seeing, it, it's twofold. It's dumb economics policy, but it also depends on dumb people to believe what they're told. And and one of the things that has recently come out that really is just fantasy, you know, uh, uh, playing off your Washington, D.C. remark there about the, the land of make-believe, the jobs report in January. It was just uh, phenomenal, according to the mainstream media. And uh, unfortunately, none of them bothered to look very deeply into it. But Zero Hedge did a great write-up on that. We'll put that up on today's show page, which is 14 06 and I'd like you to address this because they consistently, they meaning uh, the, the Bureau of Lies and Statistics or uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics anyway, they consistently overstate the number of jobs created under the Biden administration. And it, uh, it turns out over the last year, 1.2 million jobs created didn't even exist at all. Should that not bother people that the government is that openly lying to the people? Well, I mean, it's very concerning how how off the statistics have been, right? In, in several different ways, and I think we can probably unpack several of them. Whether you look at GDP, which is inherently a flawed way of looking at things, as we've talked about, mm -hmm. uh, or whether you're looking at some of these jobs numbers that, you know, as you're right, I mean, they get the headline they're looking for in the financial press and in the mainstream uh, media, and there's not a lot of questions asked critically a lot of times around that, or even you know, uh, folks that are just wanting to uh, get a little bit deeper into the data. Um, but one really interesting thing that I was talking to my good friend, Andy Puzder and Steve Moore, uh, we did a panel together recently, and uh, Andy's been all on over this as, as well as Steve, that the when you look at, um, you know, not just the details of, let's say, the household survey versus the payroll survey, and, and uh, there are some big differences there, um, but just the track record now going back about a year, if not longer, of the numbers being showcased and getting all the fanfare around a big jobs number, which, you know, if it were true, that's great for the country and we should all be happy about it. Unfortunately, it's not been true mm -hmm. for a lot of different reasons. But one is they've been getting revised downward by large numbers almost every single month after the fact. And of course, that correction in some cases of tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand correction downward, doesn't get any reporting outside of maybe a correction uh, of some obscure website or in some uh, A26 uh, of the New York Times. And so that is, I think, a really big problem and it really erodes the credibility around government statistics generally when the average Americans around the country are seeing that headline being represented that everything is just fine and we're booming and look at all these new job growth numbers. And then, of course, the truth and reality comes out later and it's not nearly as rosy as the Biden administration and others would like people to believe. Yeah. I, and I have seen that as well, that it seems like um, it was a couple months ago that I'd seen it and they had said every month that year. Um, or going back a year, uh, they had had to revise those downwards. And so now we're, you know, assuming that was two months ago, that's 14 times in a row. And, and that's not by accident. I mean, if it was just, you know, simple miscalculations, you'd have some months where you're above and some months where you're below. That's like flipping heads 14 times in a row. And yes, yeah, yeah, right. Statistically, those kind of odds, you might as well just go to Vegas if really? you're that good, right? <laughs> really? Uh, you mentioned uh, the two different jobs reports. One is from uh, the official one from the Bureau of Lies and Statistics and, and the more accurate, I think, household survey. And just in January, there was a huge gap uh, where the BLS set a growth of 353,000, but the household survey showed a loss of 31,000. So can you talk to our audience about those two different job surveys and, and, and why are they consistently so far apart? 
Well, right. I mean, uh, so, I mean, one of the big differences is uh, with the household survey, you're looking at a much broader uh, look at the economy than the payroll survey, which is looking at the non-farm payroll employment of folks that are generally on the, the nine to five uh, working for a larger employer, for instance. But the household survey, I think a more accurate representation of what's going on broadly includes agricultural workers and includes, uh, I think this is the most important thing, uh, self-employed workers, which obviously, as we've seen, a huge run-up in uh, folks advancing their own uh, entrepreneurship and careers uh, coming out of the pandemic and, and starting their own uh, gig economy type uh, work. I mean, that is a much, much larger share of the overall uh, workforce than it had been even five years ago. And so when you want to get a an actual read, I think you look at the broader statistics that come out, which include that really essential piece of self-employed individuals across the country. Talking today about Bidenomics, or rather by dumbnomics, because it depends on dumb people in the mainstream media to not question what they're told and then pass that on to keep people uninformed. And Jonathan, we were talking about the Miracle Jobs report for January. And just to get back into that, the report showed that we unexpectedly added 353,000 jobs, the most since January 2023, double the consensus forecast of 185,000, and beat the h- highest Wall Street estimate of 300,000. And for you statistics wonks out there, that was a four sigma beat to the estimate, except it's not what the headlines say it is. And we know this number will be revised downward because that's what they've been doing. But over on Zero Hedge, where they actually did do some analysis, one of the big falsehoods from the report that I found very interesting was that if one person works three jobs, the Establishment Bureau of Labor and Statistics counts them as three people, three jobs, inflating the numbers. Whereas the household survey counts that as one person employed. And that, of course, explains such a huge gap. Yep, that's right. And you know, the other thing to look at, I think, too, that people forget off these top line numbers is a large driver for not just this last period, but for uh, really the entire period of Bidenomics that we've been talking about here is that one of the drivers is government employment, right? I mean, and that is uh, completely uh, opposite yes. of what we should be trying to measure. In fact, yep. we're applauding ourselves uh, that the economy, the private sector is so strong uh, that the, at least the mainstream media is because of these recent reports. But whether it's state and local growth, which has been a huge area of uh, government job growth, or the federal government job growth, that has been a uh, really a massive driving force behind mm-hmm. a lot of these jobs numbers. Even if they are uh, overinterpreted, a lot of what is actually there is government employment. Yes, uh, I, I think it was 57% of those supposed jobs created, they were all government. So yeah, a, a lot of that is, in fact, uh, government growth. One of the other things that was really shocking, too, is that all of those jobs were actually part-time job growth. They're not even full-time jobs. Uh, when, um, comparing January uh, to February of 2023, full-time jobs were actually down 97,000 versus an increase of part-time jobs of 870,000. To me, that says a lot of people are finding it very hard to make ends meet. Is, is that how you would interpret that? Well, yeah, no doubt. And, you know, uh, you add that with inflation that, you know, this is another real whopper that the mainstream media continues to talk about, unfortunately, in the headlines, which is inflation, quote unquote, is down. And of course, the rate of growth infl- of inflation is down, but the, uh, the overall level is still elevated, right? I mean, it's unbelievable that folks are able to get away with that to suggest that inflation is somehow back to normal, where we're still 20 plus percent above on, on the base of it. And so even if inflation is beginning to come down when it comes to the overall growth rate, we're still paying that higher premium of inflation because of Bidenomics and this whole government run up in the post COVID environment. And so uh, whether you look at inflation, whether you look at the jobs numbers, whether you look at GDP, there's a lot to really, unfortunately, distrust from the American public's perspective of what we're being told in the mainstream media. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the other things that was shocking about that jobs report, too, is that effectively since 2018, Jobs for native-born Americans have flatlined. We're at the same level as we were back in 2018, but job growth for illegal aliens has skyrocketed. And like I said, we'll put that report up on uh, today's show, page 1406, and so people can dig into that uh, a little bit more on their own if you'd like. You mentioned um, wages and whatnot, and I mean, even if you got a raise recently due to inflation, real wage growth is actually down, I think, 4% under Biden. And that's going to likely take years to correct. Have you seen or do you know of what the projections are before wages finally get ahead of inflation? 
Well, I mean, we're actually going to have to uh, calm inflation for the long term <laughs> and somehow enhance private sector wage growth, right? I mean, uh, the, it can't just be government driven, right? This has to be something where we see uh, businesses and entrepreneurs doing well enough and making enough, enough money. And, and the, the dirty P word profit, right, is, is something that needs to happen in, in terms of growing wages and productivity needs to happen. I mean, just having some of the discussions in Oregon this week, I mean, the numbers of population, you know, has certainly been going down in Oregon. This out migration effect has begun to hit. And so I think there's consensus now, even in Oregon, that, you know, growth really needs to come from productivity and private sector driven profits that are going to uh, aid wages. So, I mean, this is a balancing act, right? And, and I know we want to talk a little bit about uh, Chairman Powell and some of his yes. uh, mea culpas that he's uh, made recently. But I mean, he's got to, you know, balance this act of making sure that we keep inflation in check, but also um, hopefully we get uh, government out of the way enough where real private sector entrepreneurs are able to bring that productivity and, and really the profitability in order to drive wages higher for the long term. And I, I don't know that there's a great projection out there that that's going to happen, but we absolutely need a different frame of mind here in Washington for that to be the case. Mm. Well, it doesn't help that the Democrats policy has been to leave open the southern border, letting everybody across. We've got at least 8.8 million that we know of. I think it's probably closer to 10 or higher. So now you've got roughly 10 million illegals flooding the job market. That's going to continue to suppress wages, won't it? Well, I mean, it's uh, it's a complicated situation, right? And uh, this has you know been headline news uh, here in Washington, and uh, you know I think there's uh, a lot of the, the legislators we talk to across the country are very concerned, of, right? I mean, rightly so. Whether you look at economic impacts, whether you look at the impacts in even these blue cities, right? I mean, this is one of the cr- the craziest things of this whole debate is Chicago, New York, and these big blue cities that you know wanted to be sanctuary cities for the longest time, and now that uh, Governor Perry or Governor Abbott and uh, and DeSantis and others are sending uh, folks up by plane or by bus up to the northern cities. Uh, there's been a real change of heart, right? I mean, and so actually, I think this is going to be one of the defining you know pieces, maybe of 2024, is are uh, these uh, so-called uh, progressive Democrats in the big blue cities uh, that had been virtue signaling for years, if not decades, mm-hmm. on this topic? Will they realize that the realities of it are much different now that they're actually seeing firsthand of what Texas and Arizona and, and New Mexico and the border states have been dealing with yeah. uh, just from a, uh, you know, whether it's economic or just uh, human services uh, perspective of what's going on, not to mention the crime. Yeah. Well, and the reality is they're just getting a bare taste of that. I mean, they were complaining about 4,000 people that were bust up over several months. And that's like half a day, practically, in Texas, what they have to deal with. And uh, we'll be talking about Oregon coming up here. But, uh, Jonathan, I wanted to talk to you about that Jerome uh, Powell interview on 60 Minutes. It was kind of shocking to see that. Uh, And I haven't seen the full one. I've just seen some clips of it. But um, one of the things that really impressed me is that as he was talking there, he sounded and looked genuinely concerned. Is that how you took it? Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, and uh, it was... I thought a very positive, uh, sober, uh, but realistic, you know, situational interview, right? And this is something that we probably needed years ago. Yes. I guess it's one of his pile away in the categories of better late than never uh, when it comes to uh, Chairman Powell uh, admitting that inflation was not transitory, of course, that we always knew that we've talked about many times on this show. Uh, and then, you know, looking at the long term fiscal uh, trajectory of the United States and the issue of uh, debt and really, uh, overall uh, sovereignty of the of the currency and of the nation going forward. I mean, this is something that is should uh, be a required viewing for Americans to hear somebody of Powell's stature as a bipartisan figure, uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, now coming clean around inflation and national debt issues. Uh, while it was, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly, you know, the approach of uh, going to the dentist and uh, probably hearing what you don't want to hear. It's something you need to hear and take action to make sure it doesn't get worse. Hmm. Well, one of the things that he just flat out said was that government spending is currently unsustainable. He said that the government is on track to create a $144 trillion of debt. And I forget the date. I think he said by 2050, but it may be a lot earlier than that. But that's one million per household uh, that we'd be in debt by. And yet the Democrats uh, and way, way too many Republicans seem to be perfectly fine with continuing as is. How is even Democrats not screaming to put the brakes on this. I mean, if if we're headed towards one hundred forty four trillion dollars of debt, you would think that would get somebody's attention. 
Well, and it probably will. And there are some, I think, uh, in D.C. that are paying attention to that. Uh, in fact, in addition to Chairman Powell's uh, remarks, it was, you know, the week of the CBO uh, report on the, the nation's finances and the debt situation. And so there's a lot of material uh, there, very concerning. Right? I mean, looking towards, you know, two trillion annual deficits, as far as the eye yes. can see. Uh, along the current baseline projections, right? And that's assuming that we continue along the lines of the growth that we've seen and not have a major recession. And that's assuming a lot of our, a lot of other very rosy uh, scenarios that are probably not likely to happen. And so I think the reality is even worse than some of these projections are talking about right now. Uh, but I do think, you know, there's going to be a real debate around, yes, we do need to tackle the national debt. You know, the Speaker Johnson, for instance, is calling for the Bipartisan Fiscal Commission right now. Uh, uh, folks on and both sides are, you know, probably going to have their real debate around. All right, we have 34 trillion currently. We're projected to go to where you just talked about 100 plus uh, trillion over a number of years. We're already there at 100 plus trillion when you consider Social Security, Medicare, yes. and Medicaid unfunded right. liabilities. Because keep in mind, those are totally on top of the current debt projections. Uh, but that being said, there's going to be a real discussion in Washington around: Do you solve this issue by putting government on a diet and begin to eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse? and overspending, which I think is the only rational way to go. And then there's going to be some on the left that are going to use this as the pretext to say, well, this is a reason why we need to substantially increase taxes on the rich or on basically read, read between the lines there, Mark, all really taxpayers at that mm -hmm. point, because I've got bad news for folks that think we can tax the way out of this situation is even if you uh, really confiscated the wealth of all the billionaires across the United States, you would not even be able to get to the interest on the nope. national nope. debt anywhere, anytime for in our lifetimes, right? I right. mean, this is not something you can do by just taxing the super wealthy. If we don't go on a government spending diet and really reprioritize the way that we provide services here in the United States and do it like families and businesses have to do and balance their budget at the end of the day, uh, we're going to be all at risk for huge tax increases for all working families across the United States. You know, I have a bit of a mental aversion to things that violate common sense. And so understanding the Fed is a bit of a weakness of mine. D does the Fed have the power to say no when the government wants to keep spending or are they automatically obligated to just keep churning out the dollar bills? Well, I mean, it's, it's more of a policy question at that point, right? And so Congress has the power of the purse. And, you know, the Federal Reserve is, quote unquote, an independent uh, kind of quasi agency. Right. Uh, so they, uh, I think they generally do follow along. Uh, Congress needs to set those parameters. But at the end of the day, you need to elect real leaders that will put some downward uh, pressure or, in your words, uh, Mark, more reality based thinking around the way that we spend money. I mean, the Federal Reserve certainly has levers at its uh, control and with quantitative easing and the monetary uh, policy side of things. And they've created a whole lot of problems as we know in that regard. But when it comes to the overall spending decisions, uh, when it comes to budgets and appropriations, uh, that has to obviously originate in the legislative branch uh, and go through the executive branch as well. Well, would it help if we had a strong federal chair that could demand a meeting with uh, lawmakers there on Capitol Hill and go have a sit down, come to Jesus kind of meeting with the House and Senate to say, we just can't keep spending like this? Would that have any impact? No, I think you you'd really would need that to happen, right? I mean, we saw it happen when Ronald Reagan and Paul Volcker got together uh, and created really what what uh, was the plan that put America on a growth trajectory for you know twenty plus years uh, until the dot com bust, right? I mean, that was a a great way that we were able to stop inflation of the Jimmy Carter era and uh, and also produce the kind of tax cuts and economic growth that we needed to get out from under that and the economic malaise that we you know kept hearing that America's best days are behind us. And that's exactly the kind of combo I think that we need is we need a leader in the White House and we need a leader at the Federal Reserve and we need leaders on Capitol Hill that will have that straight talk with the American public and talk about how we got here and more importantly, how we're going to get out of the situation. Well, and, and with Reaganomics, you know, of course, they had that major uh, tax cut there on, on the wealthy and uh, they lowered the top marginal rates. And that's so typical of economics is that People who are in the business of making money, when they get more money, they want to make even more money. And, and that's why, of course, you see these huge spikes in economic growth when they do these tax cuts. Um, Trump has said that he would not reappoint uh, Jerome Powell as, as chair. What do we need from somebody who would be a good chair of the Fed? I mean, what would someone 
that, that would be a really great uh, uh, Fed chair, what would that look like and what skills would they need? Well, I mean, first of all, I think, you know, this kind of goes without saying, but we need a truth teller, mm-hmm. uh, somebody that's going to tell us how, straight up how it is and not uh, really try to sugarcoat things. Or in the case of the inflation debate, not try to gaslight the American public to say something that is clearly happening is not happening. Uh, and so I think we need somebody to help us decipher what's real and not real when it comes to the economic data, to the point of the jobs report and so many of the other statistics that are out there. Uh, we need somebody, I think, with great uh, both private sector experience and if possible, realizing just the kind of scenario that we're in, uh, the kind of experience on Capitol Hill potentially to say, you know, what is it going to take uh, to actually navigate this situation when it comes to the national debt? Because obviously the Federal Reserve is, uh, you know, primarily in control of monetary uh, issues. But I mean, as it relates to the national debt, we need somebody that's going to have that credibility to go out there and meet with the leaders in Congress, meet with the White House, but more importantly, be frank and honest with the American public. So I I think having the the private sector experience, it'd it'd be absolutely huge. I mean, even somebody like Phil Graham, former United States senator with experience in the banking sector, uh, chairman of the banking committee, he's been somebody that's been talked about for years. But there's so many other great candidates out there for President Trump to choose from. Hmm. Okay, we are up against the clock. Uh, we'll be uh, talking some more about Jerome Powell, and then coming up, we're going to be talking about those EVs. We're doing that with Jonathan Williams. He is the Executive Vice President at ALEC, that's A L E C, and that stands for American Legislative Exchange Council. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're talking with Jonathan Williams of ALEC. That's American Legislative Exchange Council. Their website is ALEC.org, and we'll put that up on today's show page 1406 on iSpyRadio.com. And Jonathan, uh, before we leave the issue of Jerome Powell, um, we were talking about what would be a, a good chair, um, You know, what would be some of those qualifications. Can or, or does or should uh, the, the Fed chair advise Congress in terms of what programs they should be cutting for example like if they they come up with this massive budget and you got two trillion plus and and deficit spending does he have the ability to adv- sit down and advise them say you know if you cut this program or if you cut the growth of this one I mean, is that something that he can do or does that some cross some kind of uh, uh, barriers there as far as what he can do and what he can't do no, I think, you know, from that position, I think they like to keep it a little bit higher level, right, and talking about the macro economy and what uh, comes to um, uh, look at the you know, monetary issues of the day and to comment on the debt broadly and directionally, probably. I don't know that they would feel comfortable uh, going into that level of detail. But I mean, to that point, though, I think, you know, you really need to think about whoever the next president is, is look at now, uh, what Ronald Reagan did with the Grace Commission, for instance, where he was able to uh, po- appoint uh, individuals that had great private sector experience to come together and recommend where to make the necessary cuts uh, and way- get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse out of the federal government spending scenario. And so that's been something that hasn't been done effectively, uh, really, in many, many years. Uh, and so to get into that level of detail, obviously, you have your normal budget committee you know, process, which is clearly broken in Washington, D.C. Uh, but you need to have, I think, some other experts on the outside, to your point, Mark, that can delve into those details to say, hey, here are some really great things to start to look at and at least open up the conversation of where we need to go on spending reduction. Because, you know, for, for many years, people have talked about the need to uh, cut spending. And then the first question is, of course, is where do you cut? And uh, I've got a lot of great ideas, starting maybe with the Department of Education, of yes. course, which wasn't even uh, part of the uh, platform under Ronald Reagan. And uh, of course, uh, has never educated a single student directly mm. across the United States in the 40 plus years of his existence. Uh, but, you know, getting to that answer is really important to make sure policymakers have something to begin to dig this, uh, you know, to undig the hole and to stop digging it deeper. Yeah, well, stop digging holes. <laughs> what a concept. You would you would think most people would understand that, including people that get elected. But I guess that gets thrown out the window. There was a great article on gaming the electric uh, vehicle market and the impact of government subsidies and interference in a normal market situation. And we're going to make sure that we spotlight this on today's show page. And again, that's 1406. And and the title of it is The West's Humiliating Electric Car Climb Down Has Begun. And I know that you took a a look at that. And I I just love that article because it really did just kind of go through the different impacts of how all of the government interference, whether it's and it's not just inserting themselves in the situation, but they're now 
demanding that uh, the, the car makers do certain things, and including sales quotas. Give us your take on, on that article and the impact that, that the government has on the whole EV situation. Well, I mean, this has been a, yeah, obviously a huge issue of debate at federal level, state levels now for quite a few years. Uh, it's been something that um, we've watched from afar and, you know, obviously in a free market basis, I mean, the best men and women with the best entrepreneurial technologies win, and we're all for that. However, as things have played out with electric vehicles in many cases, uh, we've seen the exact opposite of market solutions. And we've seen uh, what we've uh, both from a subsidy perspective of huge government handouts that have uh, overstimulated production in so many areas, and now there's not the market demand to meet those needs, mm -hmm. uh, and you're seeing prices fall, and nobody's at the end of the day going to make a lot of money, even in the private sector in many cases, off of these uh, electric vehicles. But then the other thing, of course, we've seen, which is the yin and the yang, really, of big government policy, which is subsidize something, and then, of course, have discriminatory taxes on things that are in competition with it. So the old line of Ronald Reagan, a liberal view of the economy, <laughs> if it moves tax it, if it yes. keeps moving regulate, if it stops moving subsidize it. And that's the problem that we've got uh, with electric vehicles in spades in many cases. Now, once again, this isn't an indictment against electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles, because if it works in a free market, then God bless you and, and, and enjoy it. If you'd like to pay more, perhaps uh, than a traditional uh, engine uh, powered car, I mean, you go for it. But to have government come in and mandate that uh, through some sort of a subsidy or and to, to penalize those that don't with through some sort of a discriminatory action uh, is the antithesis of free markets. Uh, this yes. is big government policy at its very worst. And it reminds me of just the, uh, you know, the the warnings of uh, great economists from years past, like Friedrich Hayek and others. I mean, the fatal conceit uh, that government knows best and better than the market and distorts, you know, the very essence of what a market is through this subsidy discrimination approach and uh, gets away from real price signals. Uh, and, you know, this is just, uh, this is backwards uh, thinking when it comes to anything that uh, economists think of as a market-based approach. Right. Right. It, yeah, it, it's a total corruption of, of the whole market based economy. And I really encourage people to go take a look at that because it did a great job of explaining that interference. And one of the things, as I mentioned, that I wasn't really um, paying too much attention to was this notion of sales quotas. And we've said it before on this show is that healthcare laws are how they control people and environmental laws are how they control businesses. And these green mandates on cars in places like New York and California, but entire countries like the UK, they have proclaimed the end of the gas-powered cars and have imposed quotas on car makers that, uh, for example, 60% of their sales by 2030 must be electric vehicles uh, with the goal of 100% by 2050. And as you mentioned, this is at a time when EV sales are just tanking. In fact, Renault and Volvo are both getting rid of their EV uh, units. Um, do you know if there are any lawsuits to stop this? Because this would, this would be like if you own a restaurant, the government coming in and mandating that 60 percent of your sales have to be vegan. But as far as I can tell, car makers have just kind of sat there and taken this. Well, you know, I just had that thought um, just the other day uh, flying out to see you all in Oregon was uh, looking at there was a headline uh, that uh, projected what Ford Motor Company's profit would be. I don't know if you saw the headline uh, absent the electric vehicle uh, portion of its portfolio. Right. And it was I forget it was like hugely higher uh, mm -hmm. would be uh, the profit of Ford Motor Company if it didn't have to uh, worry about uh, that section of its business. Uh, so for <laughs> first thought, I it was wondering is, well, why wouldn't there be some sort of fiduciary uh, based uh, sh shareholder based so lawsuit That's saying, you know, point. this is a kind of loss for us as shareholders. And when those that are responsible for leading the company in this direction have violated their fiduciary uh, responsibility. I mean, that's that's at least one thought is we shareholders, I think, have a direct uh, potential action here to say if this is a huge loss on our portfolios going forward uh, because of either government mandates or companies decisions, uh, this is a big problem. And of course, a lot of this starts uh, even further back, Mark, with the uh, with the cafe standards, right? Uh, when you, the companies were put in this position by the Congress and by the federal government, going back to the Obama era, of uh, saying you have to have an average fuel economy of a certain level. Uh, and as we know, a lot of the profitable areas for U.S. manufacturers come from. Uh, 
trucks and, and uh, SUVs and others that uh, drag that average uh, economy downwards. And yeah. so then, of course, then they're uh, forced to uh, have more hybrids and electric vehicles yeah. to have but, that offset. So but, but whether it's a direct uh, mandate or not, that's been in place for a while. Yeah, but government knows better, don't you know? So I know that you, thanks to the plane situation, uh, you missed the meeting with the senators, but one of your staff uh, ably jumped in there. So what were the messages that you were giving to our legislators when you guys were out here? Well, you know, we were talking about some of the biggest uh, issues going around the country this year and what some of the big policy ideas are coming from an ALEC perspective, uh, such as uh, things like economic uh, competitiveness writ broadly. I mean, uh, through our Rich States, Poor States report and where, where Oregon ranks, uh, of course, not great news, as we've talked about many times on the air uh, in 2023 index, uh, 20, 43rd place for economic outlook for Oregon. The new rankings will come out uh, just before tax day for 2024. Uh, so we talked through, you know, what are the factors that have caused, for instance, uh, Oregon's ranking over the last 16 years to fall from 35th in the uh, first couple of editions of rich states, poor states, all the way down to 43rd, uh, whether it's the property tax burdens uh, or other factors that uh, come into play. That certainly the gross receipts tax and the income taxes and just the progressive nature of those, some of the driving factors of what causes this out-migration. Right? Oregon had been an in-migration state for many years, as we know, and now the realization is there that Oregon cannot depend on population growth to fuel economic growth in the years ahead. It will need to look at productivity activity in other ways to enhance competitiveness. Uh, so those are top tier topics when it comes to the economics. And then obviously, uh, many of the other top uh, issues we're talking about, such as education uh, policies across the states, as well as energy, uh, and uh, just a, a pretty broad discussion about a lot of the top tier issues across the country. And what were they telling you? I mean, you being someone from the outside looking in, what were they sharing with you what they're having to deal with? Well, I think broadly, I mean, they're very concerned about, you know, why is it this this population shift and all of a sudden out, out migration is a huge problem. And you know, just four years ago, Oregon gained a congressional seat, as you all know, because of population growth. Now, you may have gotten it from California because Oregon was slightly less bad than California when it comes to competitiveness. And that's been a huge driver, as we know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that is a, a real concern on the top of mind of the almost all the legislators that we talk to. Mm -hmm. Um, as, you know, as well as, you know, crime issues, uh, some of the other uh, topics such as, you know, politicized pension investing, for instance, you know, saw the even the uh, maybe maybe virtue signaling, maybe not. But the announcement from Treasurer Reed about the uh, potential divestment and the goal of net zero and yes. in Oregon pension investment, which could have a huge downward impact on returns and which means obviously much higher unfunded liabilities and much higher payments from taxpayers to fund those liabilities in the years ahead. So there were there were Several of those concerns certainly raised, and uh, we are glad to bring, you know, kind of the nonpartisan research and analysis that we had. As you know, we brought many great uh, of our publications with us to hand out for folks to really give some thought to how we can turn Oregon around going forward. Well, you mentioned the net zero investment funds that uh, Tobias Reed wants to do. These investment funds are losing money uh, consistently, are they not? Because I mean, you look at uh, wind farms that have been pulled out there in, in New York State and New Jersey. One company is uh, getting ready to write off a $4 billion loss. And so I think as the subsidies are, are starting to dry up for some of these wind and, and now EVs, they're starting to wean them off on that one as well. I, I think this is a bad investment uh, where we could end up losing money. I mean, you would think that people who are in retirement or, or approaching that would be a little concerned that, He's going to be investing poorly and, and their their retirement funds could be shrinking. Well, I think you're right. I mean, this is, um, you know, while this uh, proposal or this decision of uh, looking at net zero by 2050 uh, from the treasurer, I mean, may get him an A in progressive politics. It gives him an F when it comes to actually good policy practices, right. because, I mean, we've seen California uh, try to divest even from tobacco 20 plus years ago, where they've lost billions of dollars in foregone returns, according to the official reports coming out of California. Uh, and then you see just broadly, even in the last year, a huge outflow of money from institutional investors out 
out of these so-called ESG yes. funds mm-hmm. because they're losing money at relative to the market. They just cannot justify on fiduciary uh, duty basis of uh, putting any kind of institutional uh, client money there because of the, the huge downside. And now you have a fact where ESG and this kind of movement against exposing what ESG has been, and in many cases, it's been fraudulent, I think, uh, where you even have some of the world's largest money managers like Larry Fink at, at BlackRock uh, now even not even wanting to use the term ESG because it's been uh, exposed for, I think, for money to the uh, pernicious efforts that it's uh, been used for at the state and local level. Well, one of the things that they're also floating now is a statewide property tax. And um, according to the Taxpayer Association of Oregon, HJR 201, that's HJR 201, would allow this statewide tax to be exempt from current limits on property taxes. Back in 1992, we had Measure 5 that limited the rate of uh, the assessment limit. Uh, You could only increase it so much, and this apparently would do away with this. I mean, we've already got a horrible housing market, and now you're looking at uh, piling on property taxes. That's not going to help keeping people here in Oregon. Well, I mean, I think it's uh, clearly a case of economic malpractice to say housing prices are too high, so let's add more taxes to housing, right? I mean, this is just unbelievable that people would be proposing this. I mean, at a time where there's budget surpluses, yes. at least uh, at least in the current budget, let, uh, taking out the unfunded liabilities there for a second in the pension system, you know, why would any state be wanting to raise taxes during a time of budget surplus, and especially on housing, uh, where there's the huge issue of affordable housing, uh, and it would... Uh, you know, it seems to me like it's a very strange move to uh, stop what otherwise is, I think, a pretty uh, pro-taxpayer measure to limit yeah. the uh, growth of assessments. Yeah. OK, we are up against the clock. Everyone stay with us. We'll wrap things up with Jonathan Williams. He is the executive vice president of ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC.org. Stay with us. And we were talking about this crazy HJR 201, and effectively, it would allow no limits on how property taxes. It's too bad that didn't come out a little earlier, because I can imagine that would factor into your rich states, poor states uh, tax assessments. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you'd have to then consider whether Oregon is a poor state or a poorer state at that point, uh, because, I mean, adding fuel to the fire and adding more tax burden uh, to an already overtaxed population uh, is going to certainly impact the ranking for economic outlook and deteriorate it in the rich states, poor states uh, score. Yeah, um, pretty shocking. So we also have, in addition to the uh, property tax that is being discussed, the statewide property tax, I should say. There's other spendorama going on. And as I recall, they want to add about $3 billion in new taxes here in Oregon. No end of new taxes, I should say, uh, including I kind of let them eat cake move where while the taxpayers are struggling to make ends meet, the Democrats want to put through a 20 percent increase, 20 percent increase to pensions for district attorneys, 9-11 operators and Oregon State Hospital staff. And this at a time when Oregon's PERS has a $28 billion unfunded liability already and only enough money to meet 78 percent of its obligations. I mean, this is kind of insane. You know, many states have balanced budgets requirements, including here in Oregon, because unlike the federal government, they can't just magically print money. So how do states which are supposed to have balanced budgets, how do they get away with such looming deficits? I mean, what kind of economic or budgetary games are they playing here? (laughs) <laughs> well, they play a lot of games with it. That's uh, that's why we always say, you know, 49 out of the 50 states have a balanced budget requirement uh, in somewhere in Constitution or law, but some aren't worth the uh, the the ink and the paper that are used to print them on, right? It's uh, it's just a mockery of the situation. And if, of course, when you hide these massive unfunded liabilities, and Mark, yeah, those statistics are even being too kind, probably to the Oregon pension system in terms of percent funded, because right. that's required. That's that's basically saying we're going to earn, you know, seven percent or more on our money for the next 30 years every year going forward without a huge economic downturn that would complicate that on the long-term returns. Or, uh, by the way, that assumes that the pushed 
to net zero and divest being away from oil and gas and other uh, key elements of a pension investment portfolio aren't going to have a negative drag on those investment returns. And so that's a very rosy assumption. Uh, but the point, I think, is, is, you know, we've seen this mistake, you know, many, many times in the past. And that's how, how states got very critical uh, pension funding levels is sometimes when they had a current budget surplus, let's say in the 9-11, uh, pre-9-11 recession in the dot-com era, we saw states do things like what you're just talking about, adding in new benefits or retroactive uh, automatic cost of living increases, uh, even if there wasn't an actual increase of cost of living. And those things become part of state law. Many times they you're not going to take those benefits away once they're given. And then you're stuck with these massive new unfunded liabilities when you don't get the kind of huge returns that these pension systems say they're going to get. I mean, that is the really the circular logic that leads to trillions now of un- unfunded liabilities at the state level that we've documented every year at ALEC. Well, speaking of documenting things there at ALEC, when you're out here, uh, you had some great booklets to give away to people. And I'm looking at two of them here. One is your 2024 Essential Policy Solutions. And the other one, which I didn't know that you guys had done this, but you have also put together an index of state education freedom. And so um, uh, just real quick, uh, give us kind of the highlights. Well, the Index of Education Freedom is just a phenomenal new product uh, that we put together uh, this year because of, you know, to try to encapsulate, you know, we, we we're really living in a school choice education freedom revolution right now across the United States. I know you may not have seen it come to Oregon yet. Oregon gets an F, by the way, in the index that we rank the states on how friendly they are to education freedom, whether that is open enrollment in public schools or charter schools, homeschooling, and then uh, public uh, uh financing programs for families, such as education savings accounts that are being proposed and enacted all across the country. Because in the last three legislative sessions, starting with West Virginia in 2021, we've seen 10 states adopt universal education freedom. And in fact, ALEC has now just launched the Education Freedom Alliance uh, with many other groups that are standing together to say, this is the moment to empower parents and students across the country with these resources and education of what it means to build a more effective education system yeah. across the country, red states and blue states alike. Absolutely. In fact, um, there was a recent poll out that showed that 56% of Democrats uh, are in favor of school choice. So that is a winning issue. Unfortunately, Jonathan, we are up against the clock. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Always great to be with you, my friend.